Hi, everyone. I uh, just want to say Tansi and welcome to our panel uh, on revisionist landscape. So really happy that uh, everyone came out and happy to see my fellow panelists here. So I'll be moderating. Um, but before we begin, I'd just like to uh, introduce myself. So um, Tansi, Felicia Gay, Sniga, Asa. Um, just to introduce my territory. Uh, Nina Maskego is in the Neoskeo Nina Ochiwa Skaigani. And just to translate um, from Treaty 5 from Cumberland House and um, of Sampi Cree and Scottish descent. And uh, would like to um, also mention that I'm currently living on Treaty 4 here in Regina and uh, really happy to be here. I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping just before we begin, um, just so you know that we are recording and you'll be able to find um, a link on the Art Fair website and it will be posted on YouTube as well. So if you have to miss a little bit of the panel, then you know you can catch up on, on the remainder uh, via website. Um, another um, thing is, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of talking via conversational kind of format, a little bit different from kind of the traditional panelist format. And so we won't be necessarily presenting on the work, but we're gonna kind of interrogate and look at uh, landscape from an indigenous perspective um, from Catherine, Michelle and Mary's um, point of view as artists. So it's gonna be really interesting, excited, excited to hear about it. Um, so if you have questions, you know, as we're talking, um, I really encourage you to <clears throat> look on the bottom of the screen and you'll see a Q&A section and that's where you can post your questions as we're talking. So in the last 20 minutes of the panel, we'll have the opportunity for the artists or myself to answer uh, different questions. So hopefully we'll hear from you. Um, what else? Also uh, to save some time because, you know, all three of our artists, um, you know, they have extensive bios, they're, you know, very established. So um, I encourage you to check out their bios, which will be linked into the chat. So you can take your time to read about their practice um, as you wish. And I mentioned we're recorded, right? Yeah. So you guys, um, you can uh, turn off your mute buttons if you have it. Um, so what I'd like to uh, mention before we get into our questions is that I think a lot of people are familiar with landscape in terms of kind of um, the non-Indigenous perspective. So if you're looking at uh, landscape paintings in the more traditional format, um, it's more about perspective. It's more about uh, engaging nature in terms of perspective and composition, I would say. And I feel like in terms of looking at landscape um, from an Indigenous perspective, it is uh, much more, at least for me, like I can't speak for anyone else, um, more of in terms of relationality. Um, I also look, <clears throat> within my own research, I look at uh, story a lot, so Swampy Cree narratives and how those narratives are actually embodied within our environments. So the way I'm connected to my territory is through how the landscape is storied. So, and within those um, concepts, we also don't look at... Uh, from, from my perspective, time as, you know, something that's very static or, or from linear from A to B, it's more flux. So um, you could look at the landscape in terms of the present, the past or the, or, uh, the future. So you kind of move in and out. So looking at the indigenous perspective in terms of landscape is incredibly fascinating. And I think um, very faceted in comparison to the traditional kind of European forms of landscape where it's more about aesthetic and composition and although very beautiful um, I find um, the way we do it different <laughs> I'm not gonna say better because that's not nice but <laughs> so what I asked each of the panelists to do because I really wanted the um, artists to 
really think about each other's work, not just presenting on their own practice. Because we do that a lot as artists and curators. We're, you know, constantly presenting our work, right, to an audience. But what I'm interested in as a community, you know, what do we think about each other's work? What are our thoughts about each other's work, especially, you know, concerning this idea of revisionist landscape? So that's what we're going to be really uh, kind of digging into uh, with this panel. So I hope you guys enjoy. So we're going to uh, share the screen here. And first up, we're going to have an image from Michelle. And Michelle, um, Catherine Boyer is going to be um, posing a question to Michelle. So take it from here, Catherine. Great. Thank you so much um, yeah. for inviting me. I'm very like humbled to be um, presenting alongside Michelle and Mary. So um, I'm just grateful to be here. Um, so I do have a question for, um, for Michelle, but to start um, ahead, I'll introduce myself in some sense and then um, you'll, I'll, inevitably talk more about myself uh, later on. But um, I am originally born in Regina in Treaty 4 territory. My dad's side is Métis, my mom's side is uh, English, Scottish. I uh, moved to Winnipeg Treaty 1, where I currently reside, um, to do my master's. And I've been here for you now the past um, five or six years. I am a, uh, a, a queer woman. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And um, I kind of encapsulate all of these facets of myself in, in my work and in my um, perspective in relation with the land. So without further ado, um, Michelle, your work has very bold elements um, that are juxtaposed and uh, perhaps you could also say a type of foreground background. I guess my uh, question specifically is how does the landscape support and expand the image that's on top? All right, thanks for the question, Catherine, and, and uh, thanks for a lot uh, bringing me on to this panel. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm also very humbled to be here. It's a uh, it's always a, a very, I always feel quite honored to be uh, included in, in uh, the Indigenous perspective and, and the like. Um, my name is Bichette Boutet. Um, I'm a, an, an artist living and working in Prince Albert, uh, Saskatchewan, Treaty 6. I'm originally from Treaty 4, more specifically the Assiniboine region. Uh, my background is uh, French Canadian, Canadian. Uh, and yeah, Belgian European. So uh, my uh, indigeneity comes through the Canadian uh, part of, of, of my uh, upbringing. Um, the, the work you see here, um, well, actually I'll back up just a, a little bit. For me, indigeneity is a, is, is a concept. I, I'm not uh, associated with any nation per se. Uh, my, my history, like I mentioned, was Canadian, French Canadian, early French Canadian. Um, so my interest in terms of the indigenous is really that period of, of history where the La Canadien disappeared. Basically, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It was absorbed. Um, this is a phenomenon in history that I'm quite interested in and it's it's my um, insertion into the indigenous. I consider myself part of the uh, indigenous diaspora of Saskatchewan, specifically now northern Saskatchewan. Um, when I moved here it, it became it felt very familiar. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm working from Prince Albert with the knowledge of uh, the north. Um, I've tried to encapsulate the art history of the North and uh, the art history of Saskatchewan in my work. And that's why I've uh, worked so diligently with landscape in terms of the Indigenous. Like Felicia was mentioning, uh, in Indigenous perspective is cyclical rather than 
conceptually ir irreversible. Uh, modern, modern times, we run on irreversible history. In the indigenous way of thinking, we run on a, a cyclical version of history. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that because that's kind of a, a deeper theoretical kind of discussion. So I'm going to get back to the uh, artwork that's presented here. Here you see a piece called Frog. Uh, I, I painted this piece in, in 2015 and right around then I was doing a lot of painting. The, this image is kind of the culmination of uh, my exploration into uh, landscape in terms of painting. Uh, after this, after these images of the animals, I actually started writing in red over the landscapes and I'm still doing that a little bit. Um, for me, the landscape is um, an armature. It's an armature for thought, for idea, for history, for story. Uh, what you see here is a kind of like an x-ray vision of a frog transposed over uh, a, a landscape painting. If you, if you notice, the landscape painting is quite flat, as is the image of the frog. They're both flat. They're like transparencies that have been laid over each other. One is referencing our ideal of the landscape, the landscape itself. The frog is representing more the real or the spiritual by the use of the red, the use of the, the ghost type image over top. Um, when I started doing these works, I was uh, interested in urban art, specifically uh, uh, indigenous engagement in urban art. Um, in Saskatchewan, it's uh, as far as the top type of graffiti artists and that type of thing, it, it's all connected to indigeneity. Uh, hip hop, uh, spoken word, all these urban art forms are connected very strongly to indigeneity. <clears throat> And so I tried to translate that concept of indigeneity into static painting. Um, my interest in landscape painting actually only started when I moved to Prince Albert. Like I, my education was in, at the U of R, um, where my introduction to indigenous art was through Bob Boyer. Um, Bob's works are, are quite abstract, but um, he's a prime example of how the indigenous use landscape as, as a armature for, for the idea of the painting of the works, because his works are often about landscapes. They're often landscapes, but they don't appear as traditional landscape. They appear as a design. Often you'll see that in contemporary work where landscape will appear as design. <clears throat> the landscape is an, as an armature for idea, is something that's uh, right at the forefront of uh, art history in Saskatchewan, contemporary art history in Saskatchewan with the Kenderdine Campus School. It started with those uh, artists who were first, of course, painting the landscape of the North, but then they were starting to become expressionist. And with the Kenderdine Campus, what eventually happened there was modernists from uh, the United States and across North America had came to Kenderdine to uh, teach and to learn. Um, I'm going to mark the, the Regina Five artists like uh, Art Mackay, Ted Godwin, those guys. They were kind of pinnacle for using the, the landscape as an armature to their abstraction. I was kind of tr working from that concept of lads landscape as armature with these works. Um, alongside the Kinderdine campus, what isn't often acknowledged is that is the work of Indigenous artists who are also working with landscape. And here you have, we have um, an, another little known fact that these Saskatchewan artists were the first contemporary Indigenous artists exhibited in Canada. And I'm talking about uh, Henry Baudry. Uh, Alan Sapp, uh, Sinclair Fisher, or Sanford Fisher. Th these artists are key to contemporary Indigenous art in Canada. They're also very much influenced by landscape in their works. What you tend to see in their works, though, is that the landscape is, is, is the armature for what's happening 
there's the story that they're telling the individuals, there's always a, a person or an animal or some significant aspect of indigeneity within their work, within the landscape of the work. Um, and this is something that I, this is a connection that I find quite intriguing within indigenous thought is the connection with Orientalism and the Oriental paintings in that Oriental landscape paintings are noted for the same type of thing where the landscape is a very grand backdrop to the, to the human contact within the space, but there's always a presence. Um, so the, the, these are some of the ideas that I, I, I really kind of try to encapsulate and, and, and feel. For me, it's, it's like, um, this is this this is an example of a painting, and this painting it, it is show, it's shown quite a bit across Saskatchewan. I think most recently at the Dunlop in two thousand seventeen. I'm going to say I'm not quite sure. It's shown a lot, so I don't know all the shows it's been in. I can't repeat them all. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I answered the question there. I I I have a lot of knowledge around this this topic, and I don't I. I, I have to stop myself at some point, uh, so. Michelle, I was thinking, you know, like with the traditional aspect of, um, you know, traditional landscape and kind of the rule of uh, third in, um, mm. in uh, composition, like are you in some way kind of appropriating that and kind of turning it on its head by putting the uh, the animal as the focal point or what was your thinking about that uh kind of kind of it's 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 the afterthought that's why it's red that's why it's large and in the middle it's kind of like the afterthought it's kind of like the image you see when you squeeze your eyes tightly closed mm -hmm. we see the landscape but we forget the animals that live in it we we see a romanticized image but there's a used to be something else there. Um, all of these paintings, I was painting animals and I was specifically painting animals that are threatened by our behavior as modern people. I put them on the landscape, over top of the landscape because the collection of landscape paintings is directly connected to the uh, decimation of the landscape. Uh, we want to own the romanticized view of the landscape while forgetting the destructive nature of our society's behavior. We like to believe, believe ourselves as good rather than as uh, perpetrators. I mean, the, the landscape painting in and of itself originated as, as, as a form of, uh, as a form of, for, as a form of, as a way for landowners to show their ownership. So it or, wasn't more manifest destiny, right? Like, yeah, you know, it was this kind of an idea, a big romantic idea. You know, you 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 look at some of the uh, uh, early photographs of Jesus, uh, what heck's his name? I can't remember his name, but from the Black Hills, you know, how, how there's such grand landscapes. You know, the uh, the pristine nature of it all, but they don't insert the human or or, or the the hand of the man. Um, so with these, I've, I've tried to turn that idea upside down. I've tried to make it very obvious that the landscape is just the background. It's just an object. Uh, when I first started investigating landscape, I didn't put another image over top of it. It was just what you'd be seeing was a huge blue sky and a little strip of green, maybe a red line through it. And there, what I was trying to do was really making it clear that the painting itself is an object. That's why they're so flat. That's why I use enamel paint, is to make it clear that the painting is an object. It's not a romanticized vision. It's not a truth. It's, a, it's, a, it's an object. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, that relationship to, to landscape actually brought me to where I am now, where I'm using, oh, I guess I got a bunch behind here. I'm using sticks. I'm carving sticks. And to me, these sticks, are landscapes in, 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 a, in, a, in a large way. And the way I view them as landscape is that 
I go for a walk. I see what the beavers left. I should have said these are beaver sticks. I see what the beavers left along the river. I pick them up. I recarve them, reshape them, accentuate what the beaver's already done to it. So I'm joining his version of the landscape and we're both constructing mm -hmm. something. And, and then, you know, these, these are from the land. So they are the land. They represent, you know, they represent the land. They're all, they, that's, uh, that to me is what landscape means within, you know, the, the concepts that I'm using. This is what it is to be landscape is to be the land that you're on, the place that you're in. Um, I think another key component to uh, indigeneity and to, and to indigenous art specifically is that it's always fairly specific about a place. There's always a, a place reference, like place and history and time are all together as one thing. So it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's where the conceptually the work has eventually gone. Do any of the other, uh, Mary or Catherine, do you have any thoughts or questions you want to add? Or just anything that kind of resonated? Well, uh, for me, there was a couple things. I was just thinking uh, uh, about uh, Monkman's work and how he uh, incorporates, uh, he, he, he replicates uh, famous uh, landscape paintings by uh, uh, early paint, uh, early artists, uh, you know, Catlin and so on, the Indian uh, painters, and uh, uh, and re makes a purpose of uh, supplanting the indigenous presence within, mm -hmm. and 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 presenting uh, uh, narratives within that to make up for that absence in the landscape. Mm -hmm. So that that was just something I was thinking about, and I was also thinking about the the X X ray style that you have here. And um, how, uh, you know, this is a, a, an aesthetic practice that uh, Indigenous people employ all around the world, including Canada, you know, the Arctic, the woodlands, and uh, you see them in, in old pictographs. And um, it's an interesting idea about how it reflects the land and, and the conceptualization of the land of not just viewing it in the physical sense, but viewing it with what in, in the internal sense and what it embodies and considering life and death at the same time. So it's never just the physical out form. I think this is the point that we're kind of, uh, kind of getting to is that uh, land for uh, indigenous people isn't just uh, perceived in the physical sense. It embodies memory, it embodies history, uh, it embodies story. And you have to remember that Indigenous people have been living here for at least 24,000 years. And that history is very lengthy. And uh, it comes with uh, a lot of uh, oral histories and knowledge and, uh, and, um, and stories, experiences. And, um, and the art is directly connected to the land and it's the materials wherever your locale is, it's the materials what people used and whatever species lived in that particular context is uh, what uh, uh, indigenous people uh, prioritized. They relied on certain animals for their subsistence, you know, their, for their uh, livelihood, for their clothing and so on. And so, um, and as an extension, their mythology uh, was derived from, from the land and all the species within it. Right, and so it, it goes on and on. So that's uh, the understanding of land is very complex, and and it's all it's all relative to the environmental context with which one person lives. So I just wanted to. That's what with, uh, Michelle was, was triggering for me when we were discussing uh, the land. You know, that's that's super interesting too. Um, Alex Wilson, who's originally from. Uh, Pasquiak in Manitoba did a talk, um, geez, I can't remember where, but she was mentioning how Indigenous people like here in North America on Turtle Island are actually um, the second oldest um, group in the entire world. And if you think about that, 
um, not even in terms of, you know, this many years we've been on this land base. It's if you're looking at it in terms of this is how long we've been connected to this specific place. It's incredibly amazing why people here, like Indigenous people here, are so um, connected, even if it's like on a really subconscious level. And when I look at frog, Michelle, I think of Ajak. Ajak is like means spirit. Um, in Cree and how um, this x-ray vision that you've utilized um, really speaks to not just, um, you know, the idea of the animal, it also speaks to the idea of its spirit being on the land, you know, and those are kind of some of the thoughts. Catherine, did you have any yeah, I, lots of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was processing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to start, um, one of the uh, last things that you um, just briefly touched on, Michelle, is the um, um, the kind of specificity of, of place. And I, I guess I wonder um, in when when you begin um, your painting process, are are these, do you think these landscapes that you're representing, do they kind of stand in for like the every prairie or the sort of um, the kind of common, yeah, prairie lands, plural, or is there really specific locations that you turn to? All of the above. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, by, by the time I painted frog here, yeah. The landscape had become totally armature to me, so they they all had the, had the same type of big blue sky, flat flat landscape that references the prairie. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, initially, when I started painting like this with the big sky and the flat flat thing, the inspiration was simply driving. It was the fact that I was <laughs> driving to Regina like almost every two weeks, back and forth constantly. So it was. It became the image from my window <laughs> of the mm. landscape going by. And uh, so it, it developed into this. There was and sometimes is a specific specificity to space, to place that I use. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are they're, they're And when I do that, it's specific to my history, to the share, shared history with, with uh, the Mithis people of Saskatchewan here. And it's places like Batash or um, my family hometown of uh, um, family community of Cantal, Saskatchewan, which doesn't really exist anymore, which was a French Canadian Metis kind of community and the graveyard there. And then these kind of spiritually connected spaces I have used specifically. Um, in fact, I think Catherine, you, you uh, curated a couple of great big large pieces of mine into a show at one point that had swirls, red swirls all over them. And uh, and these swirls were meant to be the spirit of, of, of the peoples. And then within the, each landscape, which were kind of identical, there was an emblem for La Canaien and an emblem for La Metes. And those two emblems and, and those two scenes, and they were referencing the uh, rebellions led by both people at the, the uh, over river and the 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 compares the uh the methods used against the peoples that were already on those lands at the time were uh the same and the, these kind of similarities this this appreciation of the water of the land of the people of the spirit are uh or the connection that I that I use to 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 come into the indigenous. So it's um it's it's, it's very odd, you know, because I, I chose landscapes specifically because it is so Western. It's only Western, you know, contemporary Western art, European art is largely based on landscape. So I flip that and I use the landscape. For something else, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. That was great. Um, I think I'm gonna also ask you now to kind of pose your question to uh, Mary. And 
maybe we'll have Mary's image brought up. Thank you. Hi, Mary. Uh, I've been a, I've been a, a fan of your work for a long time, ever since I first encountered it. It's a, um, I don't know how much of an influence it's actually been on, on me, but it has been some, and I, I know that, and I, I thank you for that. Um, your work specifically uses landscape as armature, and, and these are prime examples of it. These were what I had in my mind when I was when I wrote my question to. Uh, my question is basically this. Most of your work is not explicitly about landscape. It is implied, alluded to, uh, alluding to a living history of place. How does the physicality of place inform your work? How does the actuality of place inform your work? Well, um, quite a bit, but first I'll introduce myself, I guess. and. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I am, uh, as you know, Mary Longman. Uh, my Indigenous name is Askipusuisque. I'm from Gordon's First Nation, Saskatchewan. And uh, I predominantly work in large-scale sculpture, but, uh, uh, and I do drawing. And over the last, I'd say, 10 years, since I've been that long, that I've really uh, started producing a lot of digital work, like this work here, Hills Never Lie, which is, uh, taken at Fort Capel, um, and it was, in fact, uh, I was born in Fort Capel, so it had, that's where the connection began. And uh, so there is my connection to this land personally. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I'll just describe how, the, how this happened, because it, it answers your question on a lot of different, on a lot of different levels. So, um, uh, well, first of all, I want to say that uh, with my sculpture, uh, it's different than with, say, my 2D works. My sculpture, uh, 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 as some of you may know, uh, I incorporate a lot of natural materials. Uh, stones being uh, really central to a lot of my pieces because I'm reviving the medium of the stone uh, of the plains people have used for everything, you know, in our history, you know, from caches uh, to, you know, uh, um, to uh, medicine wheels, to uh, even painting on rock, pictographs, petroglyphs, two large form aerial, uh, you know, view uh, petroforms, uh, la large scale land arts, uh, it goes on and on. So, um, and I also use a lot of natural forms in wood. So I let the material uh, speak to, uh, to the viewer and draw them in. It's, uh, it, I, I find uh, land to be very beautiful and uh, I'm a type of person that goes out on the land regularly. I love walking in the country and exploring. And that's where actually I get ideas. Um, uh, it inspires me, I see something like uh, some of you might know my Strata and Roots piece. That all started from a walk and seeing uh, a tree turned over with its roots exposed and there's a rock that has stuck in the root that's, uh, and the root has grown around the rock. So they become, um, they, they start growing together. And uh, so I just thought about that, uh, those kind of poetic moments in nature. And, and then that's, uh, it, I brought out an entire work. So, and so a lot of times when I use natural materials from the land, it's, it's not just an aesthetic thing, but also it's, uh, it, uh, you know, it's, in consideration of traditional philosophy of the idea of the Manitou and where uh, all life forms, all life has Manitou, a spirit, an energy, an essence. And um, uh, they say like when you pick up a rock, every rock has a story to tell if you look close enough and you take the time to look at it. And so um, I've always stared at rocks and, and I, and I I admit I have a collection <laughs> that I've dragged from one side of the country to the other. Mary Longman with your giant boxes of bones and stones. <laughs> and so, yeah, this, uh, those organic materials really inspire me. So that's where that, that comes from in the three-dimensional work and two-dimensional work, um, you know, 
Oh, and you know, there's my ancestors rising at the Mackenzie Art Gallery. And that too, you know, is a statement, a permanent statement about the history of that locale, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and thus the bison horns and, and, you know, looking at the original pile of bones settlement, which Regina was formerly called, and that history there. And, uh, you know, the bison being central, a central connector to the early settlers and, and the indigenous uh, literal pile of bones that were, you know, all over the prairie grasses, right? And, and how fast did things change? Within a couple hundred years, you'd never know that that was even there, right? The buildings went up and it was just so fast. And that's the case with this particular uh, lenticular print here, as it's called Hills Never Lie for a reason. And it's just, that is the exact same spot uh, what 127 years later, I'm standing in the exact same spot as as this uh, unidentified Cree man that was photographed in 1885. But um, I think that it's Big Bear myself because uh, I just happened to have done a whole bunch of research on him and seen all his pictures through time, and uh, it looked like this was the period where he was just before he went to prison and he had lost some weight. And he uh, and and zooming in and out, I could see pock marks on his face. And I know that Big Bear had uh, smallpox and survived smallpox. Um, in this particular area, uh, they went through three smallpox epidemics. Well, 70, 72, 1772 to seventy three, and then later on in uh, eighteen eighty one. And uh, so. Uh, that is one thing that I was thinking about this image. And then <clears throat> the other thing is, is that right beside this graveyard is the church. And Father Hovenard ran the church as well as next door, the Fort Capel Industrial School. So he oversaw that. And so, um, and as it, when I looked at the archives, turns out that Big Bear would frequently go visit uh, Hovenard, uh, the priest Hovenard, and have tea with him. They were, they were thought of as, uh, as friend, friendly to each other. And so it's quite possible that that is Big Bear, you know, in one of his visits. And um, so anyways, how it all began was I was looking in the archives uh, and seeing what there is uh, for my history, you know. So this is Fort Capel, as I said, where I was born. And my reserve is uh, not too far from, you know, 40 minutes from from the uh, Fort Capel, the town of Fort Capel. And across the street is uh, the Labret, what was the Labret Métis farm, which I actually spent time on as well. So it has huge connections. So when I first seen this image, uh, I didn't notice the man. What I noticed was the hills. And I said, I know those hills. And I thought, I think I played on those hills. And I was going back in my brain and, uh, and I, I remember playing on those hills. And so I, it drew me in and also what drew me in was just the, uh, the power of the image, the ominous clouds in the background. And this man, uh, you can tell in, in cold uh, early spring or fall weather with, the, with the, uh, you know, the blankets that they all wore at that time, which is also connected to uh, in the town of Labrette, there is a heritage building that is an old Hudson's Bay building. And the Hudson's Bay uh, building there was erected in 1895. And so as we know, the Hudson's Bay has a big history with indigenous people. Uh, the Hudson's Bay company started in the mid 1600s. That's how far back it goes. And, you know, started in the north, you know, cause that was essential for them to be up there cause there was trading and going on and, and um, this little area here at one time was a booming trading center. And, um, and then we know the other aspect of Hudson's Bay in terms of the blankets and, and its connection to smallpox and how we know that Lord Jeffrey Amherst in the 1700s said uh, uh, it's in the archives, uh, had deliberately sent infected blankets to indigenous communities to bring about the total expiration of, of Indian people. Uh, so they wouldn't be in the way of um, colonizing the land. So that's an interesting part as well. So, um, so what I did was I found the exact angle and um, uh, of 
and matched up the hills. Uh, that's how I was able to uh, get the exact spot was looking at the profile over and over again to find that exact match. And there it was. And just out of the screen uh, where I'm, I'm standing to the, to the left, is the Stations of the Cross that go all the way up the hill now. They aren't in the, the top image, but they're in the, uh, just to the left now, they have Stations of the Cross that bring you all the way up the hill to the, a little hut where uh, the, the children had to pray from the residential school. So they're made to do a prayer at each Station of the Cross all the way up. And so, um, and that school, by the way, got burned down three times and eventually closed its doors in 1932. So, um, yeah, and that was common practice, even on my reserve, uh, the residential school was burnt down. So, and uh, there's lots of archival images of uh, teepees around the, this residential school. Uh, um, and even Hoganard and uh, nuns and that sitting with children on top of that, uh, Stations of the Cross on top of the hill and taking uh, photos and so on. So well, well documented. So, um, so what I found interesting, and as you can see, it's quite a contrast from before and after. You have uh, this graveyard full of uh, these uh, grave houses back in the day. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there'd be shallow graves and that would prevent uh, animals from, you know, getting at the bones and so on. And, but, and also symbolically, gave it a symbolic uh, rest, resting place, give the deceased a, a place, final resting place is what I'm trying to say. But you'll notice with uh, Big Bear, he's standing in front of uh, uh, a house there that's uh, you know not as elaborate as some of the other ones. You better remember uh, this yard here was, was for the town people, but it was also a lot of Métis people were buried there as well. So he's standing in one that's uh, just made out of kind of, uh, uh, scrap uh, boards and uh, a couple of these ones have dots all over them and <clears throat> which I believe this was an indicator they were indigenous uh, grave spots and that it's a uh, it was marked that they died of smallpox um, anyways they replaced a lot of the graves but not the ones that were surrounding Big Bear and you can see uh, so now they got stone headers uh, and, but there's, uh, where did all the other ones go? What happened to them? And so that's why I say hills never lie. So you could go to that spot there and never know that uh, there used to be all these other graves and bodies beneath the soil. So, and so we have different technology now that maybe one day will be utilized in this spot to find out. Uh, where did these go? Who, who were these people? Who's got the archives and documents that said who, who was buried there? What happened to it? Are the Métis people there? Or did they get moved somewhere else? Or they just decided it's not important enough to give them a stone? So, so and oh, interestingly enough, there's a Métis uh, educational center just in the background. So overlooking the graveyard. So, so this is a lenticular flip. And for those of you that don't know what a lenticular flip is, I, I did uh, submit a GIF that kind of gives the idea of the flip. It's, uh, you can't really photograph a lenticular. So these are the stills in a lenticular. Sometimes I do two flips, sometimes I do three flips. So, and they're uh, uh, basically what they do is uh, it's with the software, they finally splice each of the images and interlock them like this. And then they put a corrugated surface on uh, the film, the lenticular film on top of that. So when you turn it this way or that way, the image changes. So when a viewer stands one way, their perspective is one thing. And when they stand over here, their perspective is another. And this whole show that I did, with, which was called Transposing Perspectives, was to give back the indigenous narrative to, to you know, our stories, our land and so on. So, cause they've been uh, erased and they've been submerged. And so, um, so this is all about balancing representation and giving voice to uh, both stories. Well, this is what was said here, but this is what indigenous people said over here. And, um, and uh, 
made a catalog and gave all that background so it'd be <clears throat> end up being an educational tool might be going over my time here uh, but uh, but anyways uh, that's that's how I take back the land and and honor it and and uh, give some truth to the narrative Mary, I was, I was thinking also, like you mentioned um, the idea of counter memory, and this seems like, you know, a strategy that you've used in this piece where you've provided uh, people with a counter memory, like the land, uh, you said, embodies memory. Mm -hmm. And to use the hills as a, a way to signify that history. And I was thinking about currently about how, you know, um, with all the... Um, it's almost like we've been given this task of identifying these things. Like if you think about how we've all known about unmarked graves at residential schools and how we've been talking about it for many, many years, and then how it kind of, um, it kind of falls on our lap almost, um, whether we like it or not to, um, you know, bring them out in the open. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, like, um, in a very subtle way, um, you show that relationality about how these hills, they're, they're alive and how they're pointing to those histories. Um, that's how I kind of see it. Like, it may not be what, you, what you're thinking about, but just as someone who is viewing it and hearing you talk, I think that's really incredibly powerful because, you know, I would have never thought about, about the hills, but you have it exactly you know what I mean? Um, and then you're bringing all these layers and layers of story and narratives of Big Bear. I just find that uh, it's so rich and generative, this piece. I'm looking at it like with new eyes. Yeah, yeah. You now there's, uh, you know, I thought about uh, that's the saying, you know, where a picture says, can say a thousand words, right? And, and, and uh, so, and they're really helpful when it comes to proving something, <laughs> you know, when you dig out these archives and uh, they end up be, uh, stating the truth. And, and, uh, and I was thinking also, you know, people do not believe the oral histories until yeah. they have physical proof. And that could be through an archive. It could through scanning bones beneath the soil, you know, and, and then they go, okay, you guys, it's true, you know, and you guys did tell us this years and years ago, but we never listened. So it's it's a good way to take uh, uh, take the narrative back and and to uh, force the truth to be spoken and to be acknowledged. But it's crazy, like even if you think about it, like now the the issue is, you know, these with the unmarked graves, you know, there was a lot of presence in the media and now of course we're seeing you know there's an exceptionally higher number what is it five or six thousand now on mark graves and this media silence so like we've done all this work to expose these things mm -hmm. but then you know just 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 as an aside kathy michelle do you have anything to add um, to the convo I think my question was was answered quite very well. very yeah yeah, yeah. I like that you included some conversation on the sculptural works because uh, mm -hmm. what, what what fascinates me about that is what you were speaking about how you use the the, the land itself and the, and the objects from the land itself um I'm also really intrigued by how your work specifically when it comes to the monumental you, you tend to take the care to actually work it into the space that it's in rather than just plopping it where it's yeah. designate, you know? <laughs> so, so it's a, thank you. It's almost like uh, Michelle and Mary, like when you're talking about like the beaver sticks and, and you know, just how the stones speak those stories. It's like, it's almost like there's this attempt to collaborate and with, with our environment because we view our environment in a different context because we're not just uh, looking at landscape in terms of its beauty and this aesthetic qualities or even like, uh, you know, how colonialism uses it as a way to um, exploit and take, right? 
um, by producing these empty landscapes. Mm -hmm. For us, it's like we're building this conversation or attempting to build this conversation in a new way with our environment. So that's pretty cool. So uh, I think we're gonna turn next to um, your question, Mary, to Kathy, Catherine. And uh, leave it at that. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> well, it's a little, little long-winded, so bear with me. <laughs> In your beaded works presented at Slate Fine Art Gallery, images of plants, moons, skies, and landscapes are depicted in works such as Meet You Across the Medicine Line, uh, A Dark Night on Maple, September 8, 2020, I Met a Mermaid on Lake Manitoba. And my question to you is, how do you conceptually uh, connect the traditional beading practice towards your subject? subject matters of what I just mentioned. Oh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think about uh, the word tradition um, a, a lot, uh, especially since I work primarily in a medium that's, um, that's yeah, traditional in some sense. And, um, you know, coming from my my background and my uh, upbringing, I would not necessarily categorize it at, in a traditional way. I grew up in a yeah, very um, middle-class uh, white neighborhood and it was only sort of later in life in adulthood that I was introduced to beating and um, that entryway into other traditional cultural um, methods of art production. And uh, so just kind of touching base on that, one of the things that I like to do in whenever I'm presenting about my work is acknowledge the people that have taught me um, in terms of what tradition is to me, that's a really fundamental thing. And uh, Judy Anderson is um, a big kind of cornerstone to uh, what I know and how I work and happens to also be from Gordon. So I think a very nice connection um, to you as well, Mary. So um, I guess just to start there, um, but then, you know, to me, yeah, to me the, the word tradition means so much more than just strictly the, the medium. It means um, process and of course, um, the way that this arrangement of beads tells the story about my family and about um, place, about uh, land and history, and then how I personally come into the picture. Um, so to uh, talk about the content of, of this piece, Meet You Across the Medicine Line. So this is a story about my family. It's a, their, the story of my great grandma specifically, and then um, her and my great grandpa. Um, they, both of them lived uh, along the border. Um, and as the 49th parallel or the medicine line became more of a rigid boundary, um, they, it, their families independently had a harder and harder time going back and forth, which was a, a natural precedent for a lot of um, Indigenous communities for various reasons. And so uh, my family ultimately landed on the North Dakota side of that border, but um, decided to come back up to, uh, to Canada across the across the way. So this work uh, represents those two places. So the, uh, the imagery on the left is a, a skyline from uh, the land that uh, my great grandma was um, raised on. It's a place called Dunseith, North Dakota. It's close to a place, it's close to Dunseith. Uh, and they moved together with my, um, with my, their little family and moved up to another community called, um, uh, a community in the Cirrus Valley, which is no longer 
of valley is now a lake. It is just slightly north of Estevan. So the imagery on the left is taken um, at that site. So both of these places have uh, my family's journey attached to them. And then my own experience is the process of, of going back there and, um, and documenting just with you know, a camera phone or my, um, my digital camera. And then the, the value of beating these images to me was, um, was to spend time thinking about what I'm beating. And that's where I think another way that tradition um, is invaluable in, in how we relate to um, these stories and um, these histories is the length of time it takes to make is uh, enough time to really think long and hard about any any given thing. So, to me, that's the that's the really um, yeah strong connection to um, to your to your question. Um, a bit more about this work, I can kind of describe the other elements. The um, I, I've been incorporating two by fours in my art practice for quite a while now. And that is based around this, uh, this idea of a constructed horizon line, which is another yeah, very prominent uh, term and um, visual reference point in landscapes, um, especially in our prairie landscape. It's, a, uh, it, it's an ever present, um, visual uh, cue and to me in a conceptual way that horizon line is this thing that is always ahead it's always the future and it's always from experience from your body um looking out so it's it's to me this uh yeah this connection to where we're where we're always going um, how we're moving towards that place, um, ideally in a good way. And uh, this is another facet of the, the way that my family had high hopes for what their life would be and how it would improve by um, coming up and joining their um, relations in the Suris Valley. And so these, um, these joined two by fours are the kind of overlapping between the two places. It creates the, the visual horizon line. And it's also these um, materials that are about rebuilding and um, rehoming. Um, my dad is a, a carpenter and he has the very kind of unique uh, life expertise of having built every single house that he has lived in in adulthood. And that includes the house that I grew up in, a lot of the furnishings. So I've always lived in a, an environment that was built by my dad or um, um, my dad or his, you know, carpenter friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, so that that uh, language is is also ever present in my work because of that. Uh, it's also I think this. Um, yeah, I no, I, I mentioned this uh, the materials of rebuilding in in a new place, uh, either by necessity or want. So um, I've seen the time. So is that a good <laughs> summary? <laughs> I I love that you mentioned the um, the idea, you know, of these colonial borders that so many of us have had to negotiate with um, whether it's historically or even presently and you know I think about Michelle talks a lot about that with Métis settlements and you know that negotiation and then even with um, you know my territory on Treaty 5 with Cumberland House and you know our communities existing between Manitoba and Saskatchewan and our, and our movements between those spaces and how really um, those things uh, don't really make sense, you know, because of the way we 
utilize the river system um, to, to move within spaces. And it's interesting to me, like how this idea of even environment is so entrenched with, um, uh, and the idea of racism is it, they're so interconnected you know, the environment, that's why you'll see like uh, environmentalists um, that are, you know, it's, it, it's entrenched with the idea of genocide and, and colonialism and all those things. And so, but it's like, we're talking about all these different facets that are all interconnected and complex. Like this is a really big, um, this is a really big, uh, like, framework to even like like what we're talking about are these really interesting snippets and each of those snippets we can really go on and on about like you know what I mean it's so like incredibly interesting um yeah and I and, yeah. go for it yeah all right yeah you know I the other part that I didn't even um traipse into is um this idea of sky knowledge which is something I'm really keen to try and expand more of, of my knowing around. And that's that's actually a big basis for how I started doing um, skies. Uh, so yeah, this is probably very relevant. <laughs> um, the, the development of like land knowledge and plant knowledge is what I think of as um, like landscape awareness. And I, I personally have very much lost touch in, in how to understand what the sky is telling us. And, and that's also connected to the future, right? It's, it's yeah. what we're, what's, it's what's coming, literally, uh, environmentally. And yeah. so one of my keen areas of research is trying to like understand what a, what a cloud is actually saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like even reading, even reading our environment is is something that uh, is being lost. But like sometimes I'll hear snippets even from my own mom. Oh, it's this is happening, so this is gonna happen. I'm like, how do you know? You know, <laughs> and, and it's like you know, and and I'm trying to like glean all this information because they don't. It's not like a classroom where you're sat down and and taught. You know that type of. Um, I think people think that mentorship or, or learning traditional knowledge is, is like that way, like here, my son, this is what <laughs> I'm going to pass on to you, but it's not that way. You have to kind of grab it as it comes to you. It's gifted to you in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. it's very organic for me anyway. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of mythology about the sky too. Yeah. And uh, the, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, indigenous nations studied the skies. They had particular people that uh, documented things and uh, recorded things and yeah, visually too in drawings and pictographs and so on. And so the, and they would name certain bodies of constellations specific mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, their nation and, uh, and, and by connection, connect mythology and stories about that. So you wouldn't forget, uh, uh, those uh, initial initial names, and I just want to add to also, uh, Catherine, too, about uh, you know uh, the clouds, and but also you know in terms of environment and the chemical trails, right? The chemtrails they call them, and uh, in the sky, and uh, and all the the diverse things that those hold as well, and that impact on the earth and people and animals and so on. And I remember Felicia, there was a show at one scale, and I think they curated. Where yeah. uh, there was uh, one artist did a whole bunch of drawings of chemtrails. Who was that again? Uh, Colleen Cutchell. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was very interesting. Even with, uh, like, I remember, um, like, even using, um, Michelle, you were talking about, you know, um, how you utilize um, organic forms to kind of um, identify even um, that type of indigeneity and the complexity. And I was thinking about a skun, um, the uh, show I curated with you and Adrian Stimson. And so Adrian utilized the buffalo bone as a way to ascribe the indigenous body, male body. And then Michelle, it was hilarious. He uses, a, you, you talk about a cow bone <laughs> and they use it as a mask to, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I just think it's worth mentioning. Yeah, well, the, that specific piece, that's the, the mask and uh, 
I, I think it's, uh, I can't, well, I, I've used it several times and it's yeah. actually a, a physical thing that I have just back there too. <laughs> but <laughs> 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 I, I use the pelvic bone of the, of the cow as a as a mask and it's and and uh, it's it's a uh, two sides of the same mask is often what i refer to it because the 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 pelvic bone is is symmetrical but of course they're both two different sides but so i i, I often use that mask to 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 acknowledge the the, the presence of la metis and la, and la canayen as as something that was once together but is no longer together but still have this kind of a mask you know there's an there's an indigeneity that's present in our being that isn't seen but it's the same mask mm -hmm. and uh that's that's really where that com comes from the, the use of of that um, not to... um i just wanted to say uh, michelle back to the x-ray and the connection to the mask and just thinking about the depictions of bones in the inside the body. Also, what was a real common practice for these x-ray drawings or even petroforms or whatnot, they all, all incorporated it, was that uh, they would show uh, the heart line, you know, the line mm -hmm. and the actual heart going down to the heart. And they would also show uh, uh, at times the reproductive organs. And, uh, and if uh, an indicator of like a pregnancy would be uh, they would have a, a swirl within within like the over where the ovaries would be right so you knew that was a female and that there was uh, this is some kind of narrative that's related to production and it, I was just think like when I think of the the pelvic you know I think of reproduction right and I think of the x-ray you know the x-ray images and where those and that's where they were located right so the uh, these uh, swirling energy lines just an yeah, interesting footnote. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very much part of it. I just didn't really mention it. You know, it's kind of gross going through there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's very much a part of it too. I use the pelvic bone as a face, as a mask. You know, a rebirthing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's all of that to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a powerful uh, choice. You know, you can do a lot with that. I also find really interesting, Catherine, what you said about process, because I think this is not talked about enough and how process is so much part of uh, what we do as Indigenous artists. And it's not something that's written about and it's not something that's really talked about, but it's a huge part of our work. It's like one half of the other side. You see the visual, but you don't see the process that uh, goes into it and that includes all those you know kind of uh indigenous knowledges that people aren't aware of you know and like even when you think about beating you you always hear the old you know don't beat when you're angry or don't beat when you're in a bad mood you know and uh so you can only beat when you're thinking about something that's that's good and i just like i like to see more writing around um as you know something that's a really important facet of uh contemporary indigenous artists work is that you know if you're going to write about the piece you need to write about also the process that goes into it because it's incredibly important you know and like mm -hmm. even looking at uh mary like your work um i thought i knew a lot about the piece but i really didn't and and just hearing the process of the the research discourse that goes into um, your work and how it's still kind of pointing to all those like indigenous methodologies, you know, of, you know, how you've been situated on that piece of land playing there, um, belonging to that place, but you also belong to that history, you know, and Michelle, your journey into realizing, you know, uh, this diaspora and this, this, um, this whole change within Canadian, the Canadian imaginary of like where Métis people um, were not really allowed to talk about um, the discourse of what really happened and why so many families like um, didn't know their own histories and how you're just kind of blowing it up and and you really are like a teacher, like a te I consider you like a teacher artist, you know, like, because when you talk, I think 
your artist talks are amazing. Like I still remember the one you gave at Redshift all those years ago, you know? So I think like our work is um, not, not talking about myself, but you guys, like how our work is so important um, to the discourse, even in terms of how we look at the can Canadian imaginary and how it, um, you know, proposes that what Indigenous people are and are or supposed to be. And, you know, it's just, I think, one of the best ways to really teach people in a relational way and a kind way, you know, um, our stories and our histories, our memories, you know, and it's always connected to the land. It's always connected to land or, or our environment, the sky, the water. What do you guys think? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, the the connection to land, you know, it's and, and movement, you know, like movement yeah. on the land, Na navigation. Like, why am I here on the prairie instead of where my ancestors were? Yeah. Like those kind of things, you know, like yeah. uh, Catherine, when you're when you're speaking about the 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 medicine line and how it separated people, well. In my own family, there's stories like that too. There's my 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 grandfather. No, my yeah, no, my great grandfather came from Quebec, the uh, Acadian Quebec, into into Minnesota, following trees, following the the tra train. Basically, they were they were hired to chop the trees for the train route. Route these people, and so when the train ended while well, they were just left there so he settled in Minnesota for quite a long time uh, at a Métis community in, in Minnesota before he moved into, into back into Canada but instead of going back home he came out west because he had a cousin who had come out west who's actually mm -hmm. the forefather to the uh, Jarvis Métis up north here mm -hmm. so he fo followed him into into the prairie so it's kind of an interesting uh, you know the, these are histories that are lost, especially these kind of very personal but very universal type of histories that are 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 kind of getting blanketed and and blocked out just because it's inconvenient for definition. But it's it's a truth, you know. Um, I I really like that that piece, Catherine. I I hadn't really ever thought thought of it. I really like the physicality of it, the way the sky is holding the ground up, you know, it, it's, uh, in, in my work, it's kind of the opposite, where I use the ground to hold the sky, sky down, so it's a, it's a really, it's, I, lo I, I love it, the, the physicality of it, you know, the, the sky wrapping the earth, it's kind of a, What yeah, about yeah. the, what about the uh, kind of reference to a swing, any intention in that as well, or? None at all, but yeah, I, <laughs> I never, never thought of that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like I've, I've done work. I feel I've done a lot of work that it uses two things, um, like two elements. Um, you know, I, I feel that uh, in my own, I like conflicted Indigenous and non-Indigenous identity, but then you know, I, I, I feel like that these, these things that seem opposing are not, um, are not always. So it, it like, actually that's not really helpful to the swing idea, but um, it's the kind of the two points, um, two points on a map or two points um, to move between is, is how I operate a lot. Um, I, I accidentally, I made a table once that was accidentally used as a bench by a gallery visitor. Oh no. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. oh no. <laughs> so, I, this kind of accidental, like dual uh, use. <laughs> so. Well, I like, I like how you uh, uh, went out, went out of your way to specifically emphasize the joinery of them to, to, you know, to solidify the concept of, you know, joining and then coming together and connect and connections. Yeah, like, and it's, I assume it's that's why strength. you colored them differently, right? Just to make them more predominant. Yeah, there are two different types of woods. Yeah, 
So mm -hmm. I've got a fir and, and cedar. And um, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's this, I mean, my, my great grandparents, they were both Métis, but um, uh, so taking that and applying it to my more my own identity is this um, Indigenous, non-Indigenous uh, conflict. <laughs> But yeah, but but as one as one person, mm. one experience. So um, yeah, that's that's where that comes from. Mary, does it kind of remind you of also of um, like a baby swing? You know the the ones that did you grow up with those baby swings yeah. with the yeah. big yeah. giant nails? So you blanket mean, swing, blanket swing. Do you guys know what that is? Oh, yeah. no. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's every, like, <laughs> this is hilarious because people still do this up in Cumberland and housing there always tells them, please don't put up your big, big ass nails yeah. to the wall. They'll use these big railroad nails and okay. it's like two ropes and then they take a blanket and they fold it in. And then like with okay. the, your string there, your uh, beaded strap yeah. part, the baby's strapped in and they're held tight and then that's what's used uh for babies and they'll swing right across the room like yeah. it's yeah it's a, and it's I big, I was like five still demanding to have this <laughs> blanket swing <laughs> but yeah I, I, it really it reminds me of that go ahead Mary. Yeah, it's a baby hammock right and yeah I, I remember going to a uh a walking out ceremony way up in Cree territory and uh uh, we had uh, some uh, teepees set up and the Kukums had, uh, there were spinning goose over the fire in the teepee uh, with long sticks. Yeah. And they had the grandchild in the, the hammock. So every once in a while they'd rock the baby and then spin the goose and rock the yeah. baby. <laughs> and they had this rhythm going on. Yeah. 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 That's what it reminds me of. Yeah. Or even a cradle board. But it's like it's like so well supported this melding of the two right that strengthens it it's, it's nice it's good yeah, also also reminds me of my uh, strata and roots i use two different woods for that so if, i don't right. know if you've seen it but there's uh, roots that are uh go on to the floor and then there's another tree trunk that's upside down and the roots uh roots go up to this uh, towards the ceiling and i had uh, purposely picked two pieces of wood because I was speaking to, uh, um, you know, uh, the places where you come from, how you develop your knowledge, you know, and how uh, the context informs how you develop your identity develops and, uh, um, and uh, having di two different influences. And I was thinking, you know, uh, you know, the, the idea of hybridity too, and having, uh, you know, you could think of ancestral lines. And I was kind of wondering, um, if that was part of your concept as well with the two different woods. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love the way you said that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. This is very, I'm taking a lot of notes about <laughs> everything you're saying. <laughs> just, to, just to interrupt, guys, like um, I did say we'd leave time for questions. Um, participants, if you hear me out there. <laughs> you may pose your questions, but if there are none, we, we can um, end the panel on that note. Um, Alana or Jesse, would you let me know if there are any questions from the audience? Okay. Everyone is being shy. I think they're just taking all our knowledge in. And, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're close to 1130. Um, I just wanna say um, how uh, really grateful I am actually um, for having this conversation. I've never really focused on uh, this concept. I don't know if either any of you have, um, but I'm really, it's nice to see Mary. I feel like I haven't talked to you in such a long time and Michelle as well. And it's good getting to know you, uh, Catherine and your practice. Um, so thank you all for sharing. I'm just gonna check.
got here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And it's really enjoyable. And I think uh, uh, artists will, will benefit by, from this discussion. I think that it's really changed a lot from the modernist period of land. And I'm not just thinking, I'm thinking even indigenous artists at that time, you know, and then the, you know, the, the time of uh, 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 the deceleration of Columbus, you know, in 1992 and yeah. the land spirit and power exhibit at the National Gallery of Canada. And um, where artists were at that time and, and speaking to colonization. And I think artists are taking another transition on how they're speaking to the land and uh yeah it's uh thank you felicia for putting it together because uh, yeah i think i'm gonna uh inspire a lot of artists and um and students you know just to, to rethink to rethink uh you know our environment and uh and uh how, where you can take that and you know and and what you can speak to it conceptually yeah for sure Shaw Catherine, any last words? <clears throat> well, um, I, I'm just going to say th thank you too for 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 uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, landscape and uh, especially indigenous conception of landscape has become uh, a very big part of my art practice. You know, it's moved from paintings to exploring why landscape painting in the first place mm -hmm. to where it's embodied. With, with the sticks that I'm using now. Um, just in saying that, I, I forgot to mention, Catherine, I really liked your concept of, of, of the beading and how, how, you, uh, how the process of beading is also part of the construction of the, of the ideology. Because with me and the sticks, that's what I've eventually gotten to. You know, for me, the, the real landscape in those sticks that I'm making is in the process of me stripping it down and, and feeling it and smoothing it and touching it. You know, it's this kind of method of, of bringing it into me to put it back out. So it's, it's a, yeah, you know, I, 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 I hope this, that this is uh, helpful to people, you know, to understand the landscape is connected that it's inside us as well as around us. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, really well put. And um, yeah, I think my takeaway from this conversation is something that you emphasized, Felicia, about about process that I think we've all kind of touched on in yeah, a variety of, of ways and how um, how we, yeah how essential it is to uh, bring into discussion uh, process and yeah. what that looks like. And yeah, these are these are the opportunities to to share that. So. Mm -hmm. More panels. <laughs> <laughs> more combos. Yeah. More conversations. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope everyone takes in uh, the rest of Art, Art Now and uh, great programming every year. Uh, I was glad to be part of it this year and um, hope to see you all. Um, I mean, you three <laughs> sometime soon when it's all safe. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah.